tiny piece of paper so that I can make notes. And then all I'm missing is a pen. Hello, 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 hi. Hold on one second. Hold on, hold on. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good, how are you? Doing well, doing well. You're so punctual. Usually I'm around <laughs> waiting to be like, where's my guest? Where's my guest? Oh um, my God. I'm like so anxious about being punctual all the time. I'm always early. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Me too. How are you doing? Good. Um, you know, I mean, as well as anyone can be in this wild time that we're in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, overall, not bad. You're on the West Coast, yeah? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So it's just I'm about lunchtime. <laughs> Okay, good. Well, it's just about tea time here. So I try to schedule these so that we're all like just about a break time, if you will. But yeah, I mean, it's crazy. You're in a pandemic and you have a book coming out on Tuesday. Yeah. So that's very surreal feelings. I can't wait to talk to you. Also, it's just so nice to see your face. Yeah, no, you too. It's been so long. <laughs> I know. It's crazy, crazy. We're going to give people, everyone's waving. We're going to give some people some time to get great. into the room. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, are you staying sane? Are you staying happy and healthy? Yeah, I mean, I think that for people like writers and illustrators, like we do so much work from home anyways, that like my day to day hasn't changed. Yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of a weird reality where, you know, most of the time, things are pretty much the same as they would have been otherwise. Yeah. It's just you get reminders once in a while that no, things are not normal. It's right. You like look down at your work. And when you look up again, you're reminded that you have a context and the context yeah. is very strange right now, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Like just driving <laughs> to the post office or something and, you know, you have to mask up and then you have all these like restaurants with these big signs about, you know, social distancing and like, yeah. oh, whether or not they're open. And it's like, it feels a little like post-apocalyptic for sure. Oh, definitely. Definitely. We here in France, like, it got really strict. So for a little while, you couldn't you couldn't travel, like, more than a, a few kilometers from oh, your wow. house. And then you needed a piece of paper to, like, explain why you were going. And so we did that for about two months. And then uh, it lightened up. And then they decided they wanted to get strict again. And so we're back to, like, mask mandatory everywhere you go. But it's, like, whatever is needed in order to yeah. I mean keep people safe. Yeah, we're in LA and like LA, we're having a really big massive spike right now. So, you know, yeah. I wish that we were a little stricter about it. Like I drove down to the grocery store and I saw like restaurants that have people eating on the patio and like, I don't know, that's so weird. Yeah. To be still. And why? And why? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, guys. Just, yeah. You can just eat at home a little bit longer and then we can all be done with this. And that's like the maddening thing, right? Is that you find out you're like, oh, if we all could just be better at this thing, then we right, could be yeah. out of this so much faster. But we're not here today to talk about the pandemic. We're here no. to talk about you and your creative process and your amazing work. We've known each other for several years, which is crazy. Um, yeah. And it's been so exciting to watch your career blossom. And now you've got a brand new graphic novel out on Tuesday, City of Secrets, yes. right? Yes. Hold on, let me grab it. I was going to say, grab that book. Ugh. I don't see a finished book. There yes. we go. Yes. It's beautiful. It's real. It's finished. It's yeah, so I just beautiful. got these on Thursday, and it was just so exciting to open it and, you know, feel the pages and it be real, because yeah. I've been looking at the PDF for, like, months and months, and it just hits so different when you're like, oh, my God, like, I'm holding a real thing, and, and like, the gorgeous. paper is real. <laughs> it, it's, it's such gorgeous. an amazing feeling. And, and like, it's just, and it's like a beautiful hardcover and it just looks like such a, I can't wait. I can't wait to, for my pre-order to arrive. It'll be, I'll get to hold it in my own hands. Um, but before we get to City of Secrets, like always start this out by basically just asking for you to tell us your origin story. How did you get from, you know, young you aspiring to be whatever you wanted to be to this point right here? Yeah, so um, I fell in love with comics when I was a kid because as a child of the 90s, I loved Sailor Moon. So I'd wake up every morning at six o'clock just to watch Sailor Moon. And then I discovered that there was more ways to get Sailor Moon, which was comics. So I visited my local comic book store and I was really lucky because I know a lot of people have bad experiences with local comic book stores, but mine was really welcoming. They were really nice and they 
actually carried a lot of comics that weren't just, you know, superhero stuff. So, um, you know, I picked up my Sailor Moon comics, but also, like, there was other manga. Like, there was a yeah. lot of variety there. So uh, I picked up Ranma One Half, which was probably, like, my biggest comics love. And I started, like, copying those drawings, and I just loved the story. And, um, you know, it was so funny, and it had action. And um, so, like, that's kind of always been my aspiration, is to kind of draw these almost, like, boys comics written by women. <laughs> um yeah and then like when I was in eighth grade it says in my eighth grade yearbook that my aspiration was to to be a mangaka and to go live in Japan <laughs> so like 50 percent of that is true now <laughs> yeah um and then I you know I started taking art really seriously because I knew that's what I wanted uh however like the writing side of it really kind of took a back seat because you know th there's just so many skills to acquire as an artist mm -hmm. that I kind of left that side of things because I'm not really sure why. There was just a part of me that felt like the art side of it was just a lot easier to acquire. Yeah. And so I went to art school and the whole time, like I told people my entire goal was just to have someone pay me to make art. Yeah. And I was like, cool, like that, that'll be great. Right. And so I ended up working at um, Disney animation when I got out of school, which was such a great experience. And really I learned a lot about storytelling there too. Um, but then, you know, I, I kind of fell off of reading fiction during college and like your books were some of the first books that really got me back into reading and really like enthusiastic about fiction again. Um, they just felt so much like the type of content that I loved in terms of like anime and manga. As someone who grew up on anime and manga, I, 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 I relish that compliment. <laughs> I mean, it, it, they do, like they move in this really cinematic way that just really connected for me. Um, and so then I decided I wanted to like kind of reach back into my childhood self and um, try to write again. And uh, this book, City of Secrets, uh, was my first attempt, actually, at writing a story. Um, and it was my NaNoWriMo project. It was originally a prose novel. And then, yeah, um, yeah, and then all my friends were like, it's a good story. I like your characters and all this stuff, but like, you're really bad at description. <laughs> Which, Which is for an artist, an people, artist. Yeah, exactly, right? People are like, oh, you must be great at description. And I'm like, yeah. no, because I can see it in my head. I don't know how to tell you what I see. I know how to like, you know. So in the end, like, I was like, all right, fine, I'll draw it. And a big part of why I didn't want to draw it was because I knew it was gonna be super challenging. It's like a steampunk city that moves. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I have to draw that? Like, no. <laughs> Um, so that's why I like really tried to write it as a prose novel. But in the end, I actually like really enjoyed drawing it, like the complexity of it and all the stuff I was avoiding actually turned out to be the stuff that I enjoyed the most. But I really love like I and you posted this on Instagram, I think when you were showing some earlier character sketches. Mm -hmm. And and I thought it was so fascinating and something that just doesn't occur to a prose writer that like you you showed more complicated versions of their outfits and then like explain that they wouldn't work because it would have been so hard to recreate that in each panel and any semblance. Yeah. And so you have to like find a way to be both descriptive but very pointed in the same way that I think fiction has to, if done well, like choose its details instead of trying to detail everything. Was that a massive totally. part of the storytelling like exploration for you and experience of learning which ones to to try? Like, yeah, I think that, um, so like my background in, at Disney was as a designer, which means that, you know, the idea that you could just kind of go big and, you know, go with the craziest idea was, um, you know, really a plus because, you know, they were going to model it in 3D and then someone else was going to animate it. And it was like, not your problem after, yeah. <laughs> after you design it. It's like, now it's someone else's problem. And with the graphic novel, it's like, nope, it's always going to be your problem. <laughs> If you design something complicated that's going to move around a lot, like you have to keep track of that every time. So um, for me, like I, I actually had to do a lot of little short comics to prepare myself for this, just so I understood the process of um, production because the writing side of it and the thumbnailing side of it, the storytelling side is is a huge component. But then the other side is like you spend six, seven, eight months just doing the artwork and. You know, even in this book, I learned a few things that I will not repeat in the second one. <laughs> um, like, you know, for comics, I was always like, why do they always wear the same outfit? You know, why are they always in the same clothes in 
cartoons. And now I know why, because it is very difficult to keep track of which outfit is where and when. And like, yeah. oh, does this one have a sash? No, this one actually has like <laughs> this collar. And this so do thing. you create like visual Bibles for yourself, like visual reference sheets? Or? I should have. <laughs> That's like another lesson. I was like, I need to have a better way to track these things and to make sure that they stay consistent. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that that's one thing that I would have been be should have been better about. Um, yeah. Instead, I was like, I just drew it in one panel and then hoped that I would remember it, which not a good system. But we <laughs> learn who... through the system of doing. So like for your next graphic novel, you'll know then like perhaps it would help to have a shorthand that's based on like this Bible. Totally. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, like I need to like keep track of all the colors of all the clothing. I need to keep track of like all the designs of the clothing and to make sure like consistency wise, like panel to panel that this space feels correct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I know a lot of people build like these massive Pinterest boards with, um, imagery and stuff and I use that, but mostly for inspiration and, uh -huh. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think that, like, for myself, I should have referenced more of my own artwork. <laughs> yeah. So that it made it a little easier in production. Well, because I first discovered your work with these, I mean, gorgeous kind of one pieces, right? Gorgeous, stunning single illustrations. So I can't even fathom uh, the difference it, that you have to develop in terms of skill to to choose like to do something with a sequential rep repetition of any kind of form. Cause it's, I imagine you have to plan your time so differently. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, doing an illustration and doing a comic, like there's such different beasts and you, you kind of give up a lot of the illustrative side of it when you're yeah. doing comics. Cause like you can't, you literally cannot like yeah. um, the types of illustrations you were talking about. Those things take me like three hours to eight hours a piece. And if I did that for every single panel, this book would take me like 10 years. Yeah. Um, How did so you yeah, do yeah, just like, like what was the, the labor side like from you? Um, for this book, I did it a little complicated with this book because I wrote it first as a novel and then I adapted it into a graphic yeah. novel. And I sold that adaptation basically. So I would say like start to finish this thing probably took me a year and a half. Um, not including the time it took to write the novel. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. a long time. I mean, like, it's, it's a huge amount of time. And is that doing the art, like, every day? Or did you, like, how do you even break down your day? I know how I break down my day when it's just prose. But to deal with the, the art side of it, I mean, how do you, like, how do you protect your hands? How do you make sure that you don't overdo on any given day? Oh my god, like that is such a complicated and the thing that I'm still really trying to figure out. Um, for me, what I try to do is three pages of inks a day. And it's okay. definitely full time, like each page takes me at least two hours. Mm -hmm. So that's like six hours a day. And that's just drawing. And, um, you know, there's different parts of the book where I have to use my brain more and somewhere I don't. So when yeah. I'm doing the thumbnail portion, which is just like, do these little scribbly drawings that are just like, here's where the characters are going to be. Here's where the mm -hmm. camera is. Um, that part of it requires my brain 100%. So like, yeah. I can't listen to music, I can't watch TV, I can't do anything, I can just like focus on this. Yeah. Um, but when I'm in the inking stage, which is the, the, the bulk of the work, mm -hmm. um, my brain can really just do whatever. <laughs> like, I'm, I've gone through like so much TV, yeah. <laughs> like, which is great. Like, there's tons of podcasts and stuff to listen to. Um, but I'm also like trying to work out a system now where I can do, I can write and also draw um because i my brain is so you mean unoccupied. like plan the writing and yeah like while so you're drawing, kind of like keep mm -hmm. it as like a brainstorming stage exactly so that's what i'm doing now when i do my inking i'm actually like doing it in silence and i'm spending that time actually working out story stuff for the next project oh my god so goodness. then in between the pages i'll actually like write a little bit and then come back to the inking if i need to like think about it i'm like okay like what's gonna happen <laughs> next <laughs> meditative act right and yeah like, exactly it takes a lot of time but it doesn't take all of your attention exactly it's like a lot of time but like it's really like my brain is doing whatever else so now I'm kind of switching over to be like oh well why don't we use that time efficiently yeah so then I could also write a new story while also doing the labor part of the book but I think that makes total sense because it's it's taking advantage of different parts of your brain. And if you think about what's probably being activated as you're doing your line arts, 
um, and you're inking, you have almost like a fa a nice fallow space. It's the equivalent of like the it's the shower space, you know. It's absolutely idea that like it's just it's a nice almost other wavelength for your brain to work in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. That's exactly what it is, and it, it's been really interesting because. I've only started doing this like in the last couple of weeks yeah. and just to kind of see that, oh, wow, this actually really works. <laughs> and yeah, like I actually do better with my inking when I have something that can occupy my brain like that. Yeah, I love that though too, because I imagine it, it helps you slow down, not be in a hurry to get through it, to move forward and just kind of make the most. I mean, like my favorite act is one that can be multitask. <laughs> one where you can tap into different parts of your brain at the same time. So I think that's absolutely fascinating. And also, I, I love that, that you put it that way because it really speaks to the sense that like, you're gonna continue to discover aspects of your own process yes. as, you, as you do this. Like, it sounds like this wasn't just a, a rewarding creative process, but one in which you continue to discover new things about the way you work best. Yeah, and like, um, I have ADHD, pretty severely <laughs> um it's really I'm, I'm high functioning but um you know I, I've always been trying to find a process like I've read all these books where they're like nail down your process make sure that you're consistent every day and like for me that's never worked yeah I've never been able to have that and every time I try like the failure of that is <laughs> devastating in its own way because it's like you will never be successful because yeah. you can't do this basic thing um, but I'm kind of like learning to lean into that to be like, okay, well, your brain just doesn't work that way. So like, mm -hmm. how can we adapt and still make it functional and still make you productive without yeah. being so restrictive? I love that. And also anything that just reduces self-loathing in that context is probably good. Any way to be like, oh, wow, I can do two things. And like, right. it doesn't have to be the Ron Swanson quote. Ron Swanson quote is like, don't whole, like, don't half ass two things, whole ass one thing. Whole ass, yeah. And I'm like, mm -hmm. but sometimes, like, when I'm signing signature sheets or doing something that doesn't take up that much of my brain is the best thinking time possible. You know? Yeah, like, understanding yourself, I think, is a big part of being able to find a process that really works. Now, I have to know, over the course of, of writing this book, like, did you also discover your, like, a favorite part of the process? And, like, a, a kryptonite, a weakness, something that you are just like that you either dread or know that you're going to have to process wise work on. I mean, yeah, for me, and now this is my like fourth or fifth story that I've written. Um, I'm pretty much booked for like the next five years, <laughs> which is but great. basically like every time I start writing a story about 25% of the way through, I'm like, I picked the wrong story to do. <laughs> I should abandon this one and pick something else. Yeah. Um, but I end up like pushing through it and I, I think it was something you said that like just get to the end and that really helped me because I, I would get stuck in the middle and then feel like oh maybe this isn't the right story but then like once you reach the ending and you can kind of see the whole picture of like here's the giant sketch of what you're trying to do yeah um, like it just made everything so much easier so now I'm just like just get to the end don't worry about it just finish the story and then you can fix it later. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, I actually am very curious about like your writing process too, because you also do comics. I do. Yeah. I mean, I found comics to be in some ways really liberating because I already think in a cinematic style. And so it becomes like a more direct translation of that. But to me, the most frustrating thing about comics, and I feel like graphic novels perhaps a little bit less, but in, a, in an issue comic system, this idea that I only have 22 pages, that I only have up to eight bars is, or like uh, eight panels per page mm -hmm. is to me like coming from a space in which a chapter is as long as it needs to be, a scene is as long as it needs to be, to have to train my mind to think in a system of rigid structure just threw me, it just absolutely threw me and still throws me. I think I'm better at it now, but, and, but I love, again, I think as the writer of a comic, I have the much easier job, right? Like I have to like, tee it up and then I, there's no question in my mind that artists have the harder the harder job of bringing a story to life it is not 50 50 <laughs> in that um and so I just uh I marvel at the artist's ability but I also I just feel a little bit more constrained than I would in prose fiction yeah it's interesting because um I've never worked in the the monthlies the floppies like yeah. that so I I'm you know I'm also trying to kind of learn how to work in that space because with the graphic novel um it was kind of like that it's like it's as long as it needs to be like whatever mm -hmm. 
And for me, like figuring out how long is my fight scene supposed to be? Like how long, how many pages is this supposed to take up? Yeah. And, you know, all of my references were all like, you know, floppies, like monthlies or manga, which is, has the same limitation where they're like every week there's like 15 pages. Mm -hmm. So for them, like the way that they're like, well, let's just fill 15 pages. <laughs> Whereas like for me, it's like, oh, I have to figure out like, is this an appropriate amount of time for this, this scene to take up? Yeah, I was going to ask you, what were your, like, what do you turn to for reference or inspiration when you're working on a graphic novel? Because there, it isn't the most rigid one-to-one, -one, but I imagine you had, in addition to your past informative experience, I imagine there were certain things that you look to now. I mean, I think for me, um, the thumbnailing part, which is really the, the cinematic, like, okay, let's figure out camera angle, like all that yeah. stuff. That stuff all comes very naturally to me. I don't actually reference much for that because it just feels right. Like I, I just got this like weird instinct for it where I'm like, yeah. okay, the camera should go here. This should be a two shot. This should be here. And that all comes really natural. The stuff I really need reference for is um, a lot of architectural details of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, motion, because again, I, I have a background in animation. So like I take for granted things like sound and movement, which, yeah. you know, like this is a finished product, which will have neither of those things in it. So like making up for those and finding good reference for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm turning to a lot of manga, a lot of comics in that way. Yeah. And um, yeah, like for fight scenes, like I, I do still love a lot of the Western superhero mm -hmm. comics for that too, because they are very economical. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like more, more of the artwork is the stuff that I really reference and mostly mm -hmm. for making up those gaps that between film and <laughs> comics. I mean, learning that I couldn't have two actions in a single beat was like the hardest thing for me when I switched to comics. Yeah. And artists would be like, you literally are describing multiple things and you can't have them do multiple things in one panel. And I'm like, but why? It works in my head. <laughs> and they're like, it's a static image. So we're going right, yeah. to we're gonna have to work on this. Now I have to know just because you just got your books and they're so incredibly beautiful. Uh, do you have a favorite page or sequence oh, or something that you see. can show us? I do. And um, it's for the weirdest reason. Yeah, I, I, I'm, like very, I'm very proud of myself for um, this spread. Uh -huh. which uh, is a oh, flashback yeah. sequence. And um, my character gets almost murdered and then thrown into a lake. And the water is the thing that I'm very proud of. Yeah, I'm like, it really looks like water. <laughs> and yeah, so like, there's definitely like the things that I'm most proud of in terms of the writing, like I love the way that it all kind of came together and works. Yeah. Um, like as a as a totality but if I'm looking at specific pieces I'm kind of looking at the artwork for that because I'm like I had so little to work with just in mm -hmm. terms of um, rendering and all that stuff and I still managed to make this feel beautiful and and like the thing that I'm trying to emulate. Do you feel like you still have that same creative process as most pros people go through of not loving it until it has reached its final manifestation? Or did you, were you, did you love that sequence at every stage? Oh, I love that sequence. Right away. <laughs> <laughs> you, you I mean, that's a nice You're thing like, about, I, this. I mean, that's a nice thing about graphic novels too. It's like some days I'll have tough days where I'm like, Oh, these pages just don't look great. But then if I do one page and it looks killer, then yeah. I just feel amazing <laughs> for that day. And, you know, I, I do think it's, it's interesting because as an artist, um, and I'm so used to showing my work, I'm so used to posting mm -hmm. on Instagram and Twitter. And then like with this book, I couldn't show any of it really until it kind of came out. So there would be these pages that I'm like, I kicked ass today. And then I wouldn't be able to show anyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, that's a new feeling for me, especially as like a published author. And it's like, nope, you, you can't just show all the work. You have to like, yeah. you know, hold it back. And so like, that's been kind of a learning curve for me as an, as an artist. What's and the longest sure. that, what's the longest that a panel or page ever, did you, did you, were there any that you just had to like keep coming back to? Let me see. There's one, um, I try to just get them done in one shot because I don't like back and forth. Let me yeah. see. But, and there's definitely one page that I was like, it took me all day. So like that rule of like three pages a day, um, although it's a nice guideline, there are pages where sometimes it's just talking heads and then I can do that no problem. Yeah. Um, but then this page, it oh, took man. me all day, like, yeah. like an entire work day. 
And it was, well, um, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, it's totally worth it. And, you know, again, because like, I have such this problem with description, <laughs> I need to like make this image really sell that idea. Um, one interesting thing I did with this book and uh, was a process that I don't think I've heard anyone else do before is because I had this city that moves and is kind of the steampunk city. What I did early in production was actually I built a 3D model. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I used the program SketchUp, which is like 3D for idiots. Like it's barely 3D. Yeah. But I downloaded other people's models of clocks and then I exploded the clocks. So I just have <laughs> clock pieces and then I stacked them on top of each other um, just to, in a way that it looked interesting. And then I would, um, you know, I tilted it up and I moved the camera around and then I would take screen grabs and then I would draw over them. So then that is brilliant. When I, yeah. So when I had different shots of the city, it would stay consistent. You know, it's still the same layout of the city, but I didn't have to like draw every single part of it every single time. Yeah. That's amazing. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of that being done before as like an amazing like reference sheet. But it makes total sense because you have like continuity of proportions and of yeah. angles and of all of those things. Sounds like a lot of like so much of writing, a lot of work up front for a lot of reward later. Like you probably yep. had to make put the time into building that reference, but then you would have that reference for the entire thing. Is that something you feel like you'll carry forward into your future projects? It depends. Like um, for this one, because it's like a big epic steampunk fantasy. Yeah. Anything in the, that realm, I definitely think that that's a super useful tool and you know, for anyone who's an artist out there, learning a 3D tool, although it's cumbersome, is a great investment. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my next series is actually going to be YA Contemporaries. Oh, wow. So I don't know that I'm going to need that. A part of yeah. it is also that there already are 3D models of, you know, regular buildings. So I might just download those and draw over them. Yeah. So you, but you now, this is not your first book though that you've ever worked on as an no. illustrator it's your first one that you've written right mm -hmm. like but the wonder woman um i wrote a picture book actually that came really? out in yeah 2015 it came out yeah. it's called meow okay. um i say i wrote it but uh -huh. there is one word in it <laughs> is it meow yep <laughs> <laughs> still counts it still counts yes it still counts, it, but... yeah, it counts. um it, you know it's an almost wordless picture book so it's it's in like comics in a lot of ways yeah um so yeah that was my very first authored book but this is this is a very different beast <laughs> just in well, terms of gonna, its complexity i was gonna ask you how you found the experience is different from something like this and the wonder woman middle grade. yeah um so earlier this year i illustrated diana princess of the amazons which was a middle grade retelling of the origin story of uh wonder woman which was such a great experience i got to work with shannon and dean hale who were the writers on that and you know um it was great also because like since they have a lot of experience in writing comics i was able to actually learn a lot from them too in terms yeah. of their comic process um for me like doing that book it taught me a lot just in terms of uh, simplicity and economy. Like the way that Shannon and Dean wrote their script was, you know, you know like how you were saying that like, you can only have one action. Yeah. It was like one action or not even an action. Sometimes it was just one emotion. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, getting to have that freedom to really like figure out like, what is the best way to uh, describe and show this emotion or this action was a really great learning experience for me because they, they paneled it out and like my scripts are not panels. Yeah. Um, I panel as I, as I draw because you know, I can. Mm -hmm. And doing that book first and then doing this book was really helpful just for me to kind of see how they work and um, how I work. It's kind of an education, isn't it? Totally, yeah. It makes me think a lot probably similarly to directors who write and direct versus the directors who come on to a project that's already been written. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was reading some scripts recently and it was really interesting. There was a lot more fluidity and interpretation in the scripts that they wrote for themselves to direct because yeah. they didn't, they almost were writing a conversation with themselves. It didn't yeah. need to be like, they really actually didn't need to convince anybody else how to see the moment because they were going to execute it themselves. And so it was a lot more free form than mm -hmm. working on somebody else's project. And I imagine you don't need to mock up everything when you're going to explore it as you go. But when you're reporting to another member of a team, that's a lot more structure inducing. Yeah, definitely. And like, plus the way that we worked with the um, DC was that I would turn in 20 pages every week for the first couple months. And so, you know, I didn't get to see the whole thing 
together in one unit. Like I would do 20 pages of thumbnails and then five pages of inks, and then that would be done. Like it would just be out of my hands. And with this book, like I was able to be like, oh, okay, like after 250 pages, I actually draw the characters differently now than I did at the beginning. So I could yeah. go back and actually fix them. I was Whereas, like ask, with Diana, yeah. I couldn't. I was like, well, they're locked in. I was gonna ask, did you, we think of like growth as an artist or as an author as always a positive thing. But like when you're writing, when you're illustrating over that many pages, did you, did it create that system loop where then you had to go back to the beginning and like, trace through again yeah definitely because the way that I drew the characters like after spending so much time with them I knew them differently than I did at the beginning mm -hmm. and even some of the beginning pages like I did them as samples as the proposal so they weren't even like at the beginning of the process they were like years old at that point so yeah. um you know I think that the difference in the the illustration is much more obvious than it would be in prose Mm -hmm. um so for me like going back I was able to kind of be like okay well these pages don't match anymore and I can kind of bring them closer together and actually I find that to be kind of frustrating because I wish that if I would just be consistent then I wouldn't have had to do that but on the other hand like getting better at illustrating is something that is very rewarding too to be like wow I really I did a really good job on that so. I mean you see those like artists kind of like creative glow ups on Instagram right where they show like how they drew each year for a decade or like yeah. in the way that the drawing style evolves and you see somebody who posts like 2015 versus 2020 and it's just an insane creative glow up I feel like the book becomes a microcosm of that grow up like you're engaged in a rigid improvement pattern where you're working every day the way you would train every day for something else and you're you're seeing almost like the minute improvement on a page by page how do you avoid just getting like trapped in the improvement loop of like going back through and then being like well shit I'm better again and then like how, how do I mean, you not I stress out over it for me like um my improvement loop has slowed down a lot so I think that's part of it like um you know, when people are like, oh, here's my art 10 years ago versus now. I look at my art 10 years ago, it was 2010. And yeah. I was working at Disney. And you know, here's all my pieces from Tangled. And I'm like, I don't think I'm better now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was definitely a part a time in my life where improvement was much more um, clear. But now everything is kind of slowed down. And the ways that I'm improving aren't as visually obvious. Like a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff that I'm improving at is actually like, um, emotion, expression, timing, um, like paneling, like really keeping the page interesting when it's just two characters talking for like four pages. Mm -hmm. Like those things are things that aren't as obvious and aren't as, you know, problematic. Yeah. Um, it's much more about like the specific character because mm -hmm. when you draw them once or twice, they look a certain way. But then once you draw them 400 times, then you're like, oh, actually, like this is the shorthand that I have for them. Yeah. And it needs to match at the beginning too. You can see how manga artists would just become like machine good at like knowing a, a face or an yeah. angle after thousands and thousands of renditions. Manga artists are like monsters <laughs> to me. I still don't know how they do it. Like Junji Ito somehow has like 500 page books come out every year. Yeah. <laughs> like how? <laughs> there must be shorthand there. No, I mean, yeah. so you're moving, so moving forward, you're moving from City of Secrets, which obviously has this has this um, like clockwork steampunk world building element to it too. As you said, your next thing is contemporary. Were you, are you excited in that? Like, does it feel freeing or do you feel a little daunted to not have like the same kind of, you're gonna have to find a new set piece quality that doesn't rely as much on the architecture or the magical element of mm -hmm. it. Yeah, they're very different projects. So actually right now I'm working on the sequel to City of Secrets. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm finishing out that story. So it's kind of nice to still be living in this world while people are picking up the first book. Yeah. Because I get to kind of feel like, oh, like you're in it and I'm in it, which is pretty cool. Um, but then my next book, yeah, it's YA Contemporary. And part of it is like, I'm glad because I don't have to draw these yeah. crazy cities anymore. I get to kind of just draw like a normal high school. Yeah. Um, and I think that, like, for me as a writer, like, I'm still trying to kind of define what it is that I love about stories and which stories I like to tell. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, like, having those two different sides, the fantasy and the very contemporary, um, it's kind of like a nice little rest. <laughs> I'm going to have, like, another year to just, like, okay, like, you get to focus on emotion and all those yeah. things and not worry too much about, like, 
you know, magic systems and all that. So. It's a palate cleanser, right? And so yeah, it's, totally. So it'll just be a different education, I imagine, in that, like, yeah, absolutely. you've learned so much structural or architectural or design in this, and that's, it'll just, like, maybe you won't even know what kind of way it'll be in education until you're in it. Yeah, totally. So what haven't you done yet that you want to do? Oh, man, I totally want to do, like, a high fantasy, like, something uh -huh. with, like, elves and orcs and witches and, um, you know, just really lean into, like, the Tolkien-esque um, tropes, you know, because I think that there is something very fun about that artwork and also having that structure. It's almost like doing it contemporary because you don't have to explain it. You're like, you yeah. guys get it, right? <laughs> it's it's the, that, that world. Yeah. Um, so that would be really exciting for me. Um, otherwise, like... I've also in development actually at Cartoon Network for a pilot for a new show that is oh, a, um, actually it's based on that um, pitch I sent you years ago. Yeah, yeah. Put that a little bit together. yeah. Um, it went back to being a teen romance. So that's the version it is right now. So we're working on um, building a pilot for that, which I'd be really, really that's psyched so if that comes together. Yeah. I mean, iron's in the fire, right? Like that's the whole trick of being a creative in this industry is like having lots of of burners on the pot on the stove top right yeah and like you know seeing like your work and the types of things that you're doing like screenplays and books and comics yeah. like that's always been my goal like um you and Neil Gaiman like that's the career that I would like to kind of have <laughs> you know to touch all the media to do all kinds yeah. of things like that well, would be really really great I think mine comes from just an inability to sit still but I also <laughs> I remember like very vividly when I was a lot younger seeing a Neil Gaiman quote that basically was like the only thing I want my projects to have in common is my name on the cover and like just thinking I mean the, one of the reasons you know that I like I, I admire him so much is because when you come into a creative profession you're kind of told like now you choose you choose exactly what your spot's going to be in that creative profession and that's such a fallacy like where you come in and you're like I'm going to be an author and then they're like okay so you're not going to be a poet or an artist or a screenwriter or any of these things and I'm like no I want to be those like I want to be yeah. all of those things and I remember seeing like a, a short story collection my Neil had like poetry and song and short story and then I found out he had written like the adaptation for I think it was Princess Mononoke and I was like yeah I was like how is this how is this possible like how can you do all these things and I'm like but that's what I want to do I want to do all these things um, so like, do you have, like, I keep a list, right? Do you have a list of like things you want to do? Oh, like in, I, I have lists of, of stories I want to tell. Yeah. Um, like I have all these like little notes and outlines and a lot of them are like kind of figured out already. Yeah. Um, my next one that I really want to try to get done probably before quarantine ends is I have a short horror that's Ooh. about Munchausen's by proxy. <gasps> one of the uh, scariest things out there. And it's like, it's so, so different than anything I've done before because it's very, very gory and yeah. <laughs> very scary. And, but it's like a story that I've, I, I love, like it's kind of short, it's going to be short. It's going to be like a, maybe a 30 page short comic. Okay. Um, so that's definitely something that I'm working on right now. And then I have like, I don't know, all these different YA teen, more middle grade, like yeah. just everything. Like, yeah, like I, I want to tell contemporary, I want to tell fantasy, I want to tell, um, yeah, like more steampunk even. And your problem science is not fiction. A, your problem is not a shortage of ideas. <laughs> yeah, like I, my problem is the fact that these books take so long. I was going to say I literally can't do more. <laughs> and it's not. Is it something where if time, like if you could break down your day, so like I can't work on multiple fictions at the same time mm -hmm. because of voice. But do you find the same thing to be true for visual style? Do you have any translation trouble moving from one to another? Like, could you hypothetically? work on the City of Secrets sequel in the morning and a contemporary in the afternoon and have like an easier time translating between, like I can't get myself out of one world building and voice and into the other. I feel like I lose more than I gain by trying to do both at once. But I don't know, is that true in the visual world? You know, that's a good question. I've never actually attempted that. Like so mm -hmm. far I've been lucky enough that all of my projects have been pretty separate. And when they're not, like when they overlap, they tend to overlap in different stages of the process so like yeah. for example when I was doing Diana I was inking that when I was thumbnailing City of Secrets so like those two things never really crossed over in terms of yeah. stylistic um but I I wonder if I would be able to do it because part of me thinks that I can because yeah. when I 
when I'm doing this, I also like um, at night when I'm like, I'm just doodling, like I'm drawing things that are completely different style wise. So you should uh, be able to. Okay, but I am also just like, I, I have to, I've, I'm so creatively curious about process that mm -hmm. I wonder, um, again, as like a prose novelist, I, I use cheat codes like songs. I use, and I, and like, I wonder, I use mental color palettes and I'm realizing you use actual color palettes. <laughs> like, what do, do you have any cheat codes? Like, do you have anything that you now associate with kind of dropping yourself into the energy, the vibe, or because it's visual, do you not need that? Hmm. Like for me, I actually, don't really like I've tried to do the thing where it's like oh music and like the certain mm -hmm. soundtrack to kind of get me into it I had that more when I was writing it when I'm doing the like bulk of the illustration I actually like I don't know like anything like I've rewatched okay. The Office twice and <laughs> you know things like that um so like, they, they're really more of a distraction for me so I can continue to move my hand mm -hmm. um but yeah like definitely when I was writing the book I, to get myself in the mood I would listen to the soundtrack to um Imitation Game okay because yeah. it felt you know, as close as I could to something like that. Um, it's still, it's not something that works for me all the time, though, because like, I've tried that to, to find a playlist and start that and try to program your brain into that. But like, for yeah. me, with my ADHD brain, it, it doesn't, doesn't work. work. It works against you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it doesn't actively work against me. But like, it doesn't really like activate anything in my mind. Yeah. So I do have to ask though about color palette, uh, because that's probably like the way in which I see the world most mm -hmm. clearly. And I feel like one of my first impressions that I get of a story that I'm writing is is its soundtrack and its color palette and so I'm just wondering how did you go about much like the streamlining of the clothes right and showing how you got mm -hmm. to something that could be replicable how did you go about the color palette is there experiment a lot of experimentation that goes into it um, so this book, particularly, I had to do pretty much everything. Uh, I ended up getting an assistant to help me with some of it, but I had to figure out this color process yeah. on my own. And I knew that I needed it to be efficient, but I wanted it to look full color. So mm -hmm. I actually developed a process that is not full color, but looks full color. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I basically like colored, painted the whole thing black and white. Like I rendered everything in black and white. And then I use like a filtering process in Photoshop to just kind of make it like sepia toned. Mm -hmm. And then I layered on almost like watercolor, like transparent washes on it. Yeah. And so when you look at it, it feels like it's full color, but it really isn't. So it's like um, a modified. Yeah, it's like a modified, it's almost like a colorized photograph. So like if you were yeah. to, you know, take a black and white photograph and then paint on it, that's much more of the process that it was. And it wasn't actually like, like a full comic coloring because I just didn't feel like I had the time or the energy to be able to do that. Um, with my next book, it's going to be a much more limited palette and it's going to be very flat and stylistically it's going to look incredibly different. I already have like sample pages that are out there and it's very flat and very um, like it's, it's three colors that are very blues and mm -hmm. purples and they don't have a lot in common actually. Like it almost feels like they are drawn by different people. <laughs> I'm so excited by that, though, because one of my favorite things about your work is like, while I definitely looking through Instagram and your pages feel like you have a style, you also have like this incredible flexibility, like almost a transformational ability to put on other styles and to like render in different ways, I think is so unique and so beautiful. So I'm excited to see this next manifestation or this alternate manifestation. If yeah, you that's will. definitely like from my background in animation because having that flexibility of being able to just like work in whatever show they slotted you into like, you're like oh okay you're actually gonna work on this other project now and you're gonna work on this project and being able to adapt quickly and just be like yeah I can do any of it yeah um, was very much a plus but when I was in picture books that was actually kind of a problem because they didn't know how to like brand me as an mm -hmm. illustrator because <laughs> yeah. I was like I can do that yeah and I can do that so you know, doing my own stories, it means that like, I am the right illustrator for each of these stories every time because I made them. And then I get to kind of pick the style that I want to do them in. Yeah. And I love that I can actually tell these two separate stories and have them visually feel very different, while still both of them are still mine. I just know in prose, sometimes it's very obvious to me right away what kind of voice I want to use. And sometimes it takes a lot of self exploration to figure out the right voice. Do you always know immediately going in the style? Or is no, it, is it um, 
yeah, it, it takes me a lot of time to figure it out. Like, especially for City of Secrets, the first one, when I started inking it, I spent like three weeks just changing my brushes, changing the style of inking because I would just look at all these other books and be like, that's beautiful and that's beautiful <laughs> and that's beautiful. Yeah. And then, you know, finally someone was just like, just, just, it's fine. Like use the one you use for the sample and just finish it. You know, yeah. it's like the same thing with um, writing. It's like, just get to the end. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. So I normally end these interviews by asking a very specific question. And I always, it's always easier when I'm asking authors or creators who have like a, a large body of work out there to answer this. So this might be harder to ask, to ask or to answer, but I am always really curious. I usually end by asking if you could only choose one thing that you've touched, one thing that you've created to outlive you, what mm -hmm. would it be? But also the caveat that I've added is that it can be something you haven't done yet. Sometimes it's like, sometimes we're convinced, like I had this experience when I finished Addie for a couple weeks after finishing Addie LaRue, I thought, okay, if I never write again, I'd be okay with that. And it was the most, I, it was like 17 books and I never ever anticipated feeling that way about anything because I can't wow. imagine that. And it was such a weird sensation. It, it was, and I had so much conviction around that concept that it was the first time in my life where I thought, okay, if one book outlives me, I hope it's that book. So I'm just wondering, do you have even a glimmer in your eye? Is it City of Secrets? Is it, is it Meow? Like, or is it something <laughs> that we haven't seen anything of yet? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I totally feel you on that. And I'm so excited for Addie LaRue too. I'm, I'm like Ugh. dying to get that book. Um, <laughs> but like for me, when I was drawing City of Secrets, my dad actually passed away in an accident. Um, and I had to think a lot about like, what would happen if I died suddenly? And yeah. for me, I was like, I just have to get this book to a point where someone could read it. It doesn't have to be finished, it doesn't have to be perfect, but as long as it gets out there, then I'd be happy. You know, I'd be like, great, that's fine. Um, in terms of like things that I haven't, that I haven't finished that I, you know, that are really important to me. Um, my book, Hungry Ghost, which is my YA contemporary, it's yeah. about um, growing up Asian American with an eating disorder um, and kind of the cultural baggage that comes along with that. Like that is something that is very near and dear to my heart and really does, um, that's something that I would really love to, to see out in the world and to, to outlive me. Yeah, I love that. That's such a, I'm so, well, I'm so sorry for your loss. And I also just think it's something where, um, like creating art or creating novels is so important, but also sometimes perspective moments happen in our life where we realize like they're both conduits, but they're also, they can feel so small like they can feel so big and so important and so small. And it can be really interesting when things come along that just kind of like shove our entire creativity into perspective. Yeah, And I just totally. like, yeah, I'm, I think that's such a, a hard thing to go through, but also it, you're right. It, it sounds like it formed your relationship with this book in terms of what it meant to finish something and to, to do what you can when you can with it. Yeah, but, like I think that in the end, my, my feelings about it were, I've done everything that I can. I've tried as hard as I can. I've taken every risk and pushed myself to the edges of my ability. So whatever happens, I have no regrets. Like if, if something happened, which there, yeah. it doesn't seem to be, I mean, COVID, you know? Yeah, I was gonna say, so. it's, a strange, it's a strange world. I will say half the reason that I finished Addy when I did was I definitely hit a point after working on it for like eight years where I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to die before this book is done. Like I'm going, <laughs> like literally never going to, it's going to be the book that I told everyone about that I never finished. And that like gave me the kick that I was like, I have to finish it. I just have yeah. to like, even if it's imperfect, I have to, I have to reach the end. And I think for anyone watching us who is a creative, like if you find yourself getting stuck, the thing about reaching the end is it's not about like making something good. It's just about carving a path that you can follow. And I feel like it takes it from a desert to a football field, right? Like suddenly there's a, there's a prescribed yeah. amount of distance you have to cover. All I can say right. is, I'm so excited for City of Secrets. I can't believe it comes out Tuesday. Yay. Time is a lie. I can't <laughs> yeah. wait for my copy to arrive. Um, I'm so proud of you. I just, thank I, you. I'm thank so you. glad that we got to talk before your book release. I can't wait for it. And I cannot wait for Hungry Ghosts. And I cannot wait to see everything that you do next. 
Oh, thank you so much. And your support means the world to me. It really has. And, you know, again, like you really got me back into reading fiction. So weirdly, my career kind of I owe it to you in some ways. Art, art begets art, right? Yeah. Art, art just creates more art. So I am so, so happy that our paths crossed. I, I can't wait to see everything that you do. Truly. You. I hope that you have a wonderful release week. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Everybody go and pre-order and buy City of Secrets. And this video will live on my page and then over on YouTube. So anyone who missed any pieces of it will be able to find it. You can direct them there. Uh, it was so good talking with you. Yeah, it was great talking to you too. <laughs> Have a great release week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.